He had preserved the best part of her and made it his own, the principle of her scent. Welcome to Band Book Club. We're your hosts, Rafaela, Nick, and Nicolas. This quote was taken from Patrick Suskin's novel Perfume, The Story of a Murderer. The story takes place in 1800s and follows our anti-hero Jean-Baptiste Granoui, who is an orphan with an exceptional sense of smell. Granoui is able to capture and break down any smell and its nuances. As the story develops, we find that he doesn't have a smell of his own and that he starts experimenting with perfumes, becomes a perfumer and captures all kinds of smells, even if he has to kill for it. Dang. And he does. And he does. And he does. Spoiler Hence, alert. Story of a murder. <laughs> yeah, it says it on the front of the book. I found this book because of Scentless Apprentice by Nirvana. Yeah. Have was, you guys heard that it song? Was, yeah, well, through you. It was Kurt Cobain's favorite book, and he read it like 15 times, and he carried it around with him all the time. Yeah, to me, that was the weakest song on In Utero, but um, I'm glad... It was there because I never would have found this book otherwise. And this was one of the most unique, unique books. I mean, who does anything with smell? I certainly have not read a book like this one. It made you smell things as you read it. It made me appreciate my nose. Yeah. It made me think of really stinky smells. It opens up with him being born in a what do we call it fish market his mom yeah his mom is a like a fishmonger slash prostitute hybrid worker <laughs> and it's i guess alluded to she's had a bunch of kids this way before yeah, but she, she just basically... goes like under her her fish stand and gives birth and just uses the same knife she descales fish with to cut the umbilical cord and she just leaves the baby there and, and walks away and I don't know, that that whole scene just made me feel sick. Yeah, it was very emotional, but it, it's also a great opening because it establishes just how much everything stank back then before deodorant and <laughs> people having access to showers and well, cleaning products. And they're in this fish market and you can like almost taste it, how dirty and sweaty and stinky all the people are and the I think, fish. I think what's also really unique about that opening or just in general the book usually when you hear about paris or you've read things about paris seen movies with paris it's always this perfect romantic beautiful place and then this just shows a very disgusting side of it probably a more realistic view of what france was probably like in the 18th century i think the narrator says something about because Paris was the biggest city back then in Europe, it was the stinkiest. Mm -hmm. And that's just the first of many parallels the narrator makes between people and stinky smells and <laughs> bad stink and rottenness. But, but there's also... This is a very misanthropic book. There, there are good smells in this book. We're making it sound like it's all about stank. Yeah, but there's much more dirtiness yes. than sweetness. The, the way it was written, it made you want to smell more. Like you said, you appreciated the smell. But it's the only book that I've read in my life that was able to give me this feeling. It was written beautifully, mm -hmm. and the rhythm was just... It was like a dance of words. That's the best I can describe it. Yeah, it wasn't uh, sparsely written. I mean, it's it's a concisely told story, but the lines are long and flowery, but very... He's not, like, loose with them. No. They're, he's very delicate with the words that he's using, and he's using them right. I read one guy analyzing the the style of the prose in this book, and he said he has these really long, beautiful lines on purpose because the world of smell or whatever is complicated and, like, takes over your imagination and takes you for a ride. But it's also something that's kind of a joke if you try to put it into language and there's i forget off the top of my head but there's some lines in the book that are very self-aware from the writer that say you know basically you can't get that far 
with words to describe the world of smell. But he gets about as close as I think anybody could. Well, what's also interesting about the way it's written is it was written originally in German. And so it is kind of amazing that it was able to be translated in such a good way. So it was translated by John Woods, and he actually won a, I guess this is a very prestigious award. It's a, a pen translation prize in 1987 for this for this book of his translation and so i guess it kind of makes you wonder what it would be like what the experience would be like if you read it in the original german text but it seems like he did a very good job with the translation because i think there are some books that have been translated and you read it and something's off about it you know what i mean I didn't get that. Sense you didn't get with that this with this book. Not, not with yeah, this one. not with this one. So I think it was a really good translation. And it was translated in forty nine languages. Forty nine language, yeah. and it sold more than twenty million copies. It's one of the best selling German novels of the twentieth century. And my favorite book of all time. Do you want to jump into that or talk about the movie? I think we should talk about the movie. Okay. Well, it's definitely better than less than zero. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think the they left a lot of things out once again because clearly it's not possible to cover everything, but the stuff that they did cover, it was very detailed and yes, it was difficult to describe smell through TV. This movie raced through like the first two thirds of the plot in about Less yeah. than 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it then, was very fast. And it strung out the part where he's actually killing the girls at the end. Right. I don't know. It's, like we said, hard to translate smell even into writing. I think it's probably even more difficult to try and translate that into a movie with images where you can't even talk about how someone's thinking. We were saying, you know, when you watch this movie, it's just going to be Grand Wee and, like, somebody walks by with an apple pie and he's just like uh and how many times can you <laughs> yeah, show that he, he be was effective? really and sniffing he, he did he did sniff a lot yeah i think the director tried to make up for that by just having a bunch of quick montages of things the picture of it was amazing though. yeah it, it looked good and the beginning visually. where he gets born in the fish market it was i think the whole cinematography was beautiful i got a couple bones to pick with this movie though what is it probably the way I think the director mishandled some of the key scenes. Like my favorite scene in the whole book when he's uh, after Grand Wee's been working with that Tanner guy or whatever and he's gotten some free time off of work because he's worked hard for like 15 years in a row. Oh, and he appreciates the outside and all the stuff. Yeah, he's there's like a uh, fireworks ceremony going on and it's filling all the smells in the air with smoke. But underneath, he smells something that he hasn't smelled before. And it's very faint, but powerful at the same time. And he follows the smell, and he gets to this girl in an alley that's peeling yellow plums. The girl that started, that started everything. Yeah. I mean, this was, was like the most critical scene in the book. Yeah, absolutely. Me, one of them. And um, uh, you remember in the movie, it's like he can't control himself He once he's got this scent and it He's like sort of just a, I don't know, deranged serial killer tracking, chasing a woman. And he goes up behind her and he doesn't look like he knows what to do and he freaks out. And he, does he club her on the head or something like that? I think he so. He just choke. Yeah, he clubs her and then chokes her. Yeah. yeah. In the book, it was completely the opposite. He did it like... It was magical. Yeah. In the book, it was... It, I, I wish he was able to translate it into the movie, but, but I don't know. He didn't do a good job. I agree with you. Yeah, it was like, it was almost showing you that he felt bad in yeah. the, the movie when he did it. He didn't know what to do. and But uh, in the book, he doesn't have any regrets for anything, no remorse. He just only cares about the smell of this girl, which is the only way he can relate to people. I have to say, it freaks me out every time I read something like this. Such a horrific thing. But it's such a beautiful thing that you keep reading it over and over because it was written so beautifully. It was just a, the, the most beautiful poem, the most beautiful dance, the most beautiful colors you have ever seen, written in few sentences. Yeah, the language was super fun in this book. 
I know that's not a very satisfying sentence, but it just takes you for a ride, kind of like a poem, like you said. I think, I think another big flaw is the fact that Grinwe in the movie was pretty cute. Where Yeah, he was too <laughs> handsome. In the book, he's like a hunchback. That talks like this, you know. Yeah, in the book, he's a the guy says he's a tick. He's an abomination. He's like a, a he's lizard. Like I think sometimes, yeah, he's basically like Smeagol from the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but they gave Ben Winshaw. Yeah, bit Winshaw. 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 I, I think it's Winshaw. He's in James Bond, but he's Q in James Bond. Yeah, he's not like a hunky guy, but he he looks like he could be in like a Prada ad or something with those skinny like femme boys. <laughs> yeah, he, nice. he was too cute to play. Yeah, he Grand was way, way too beautiful to be Granwy. Everybody thought he was ugly and hated him. And that's why I loved Granwy in the book, because he was so ugly, but he had the character, you know. Yeah. And I got to say, if you choose to read this book, or listen to it rather, it's got my favorite audiobook reading. Oh, yes, let's talk about all. this. Yes. This narrator really put his heart into it. <laughs> it was very enjoyable An to listen job. to it. An amazing job, absolutely. He really was acting out every single part. Yeah, he seemed almost like a guy with like a theater background or something. The way he would take on these different characters and give them different voices. and uh, But just the tone of his voice was perfect for the story. It was... I don't know. How, how would you describe it? Felt it felt like I was... It was my bedtime, and I'm by the fire, and my grandpa was reading me a story that was but a very, famous. Very but a very talented a, grandpa. A talented grandpa. <laughs> I was say, your grandpa must be kind of messed up. He's reading you perfume. I know. Not, okay. Well, in this scenario, I'm not a child. What did you guys think this story was about? Because I have some different theories. What do you think the author is trying to say, if he's trying to say anything? I I don't know if he was going somewhere with it. I'm sure he was. But I, I couldn't nail it down. That's what I kept seeing in the, the criticism or analysis I read about this book is the main character is horrible. He's an evil guy. Basically, everyone else in the story is evil and disgusting. And he has a horrible goal that he basically achieves and doesn't get any better from. And a lot of them were just feeling like, what was he trying to say at the end of this? But... um I think, and I never found any other evidence from another critic to back this up, but I think the book is about writing. Why well, you say that? Well, just the way he described smell was very similar to how I've heard a lot of writers describe writing and how, I guess it kind of makes me feel, or the point of it is reducing things down to their essence, which the book talks about a lot or like their true identity, or like seeing things in a deeper way. Because Grand Wee basically, he ha he takes one smell of somebody, and he knows everything about them, like what they do for work, some weird habit they have, like if they smoke or not, or you know if they touched something in a forest. But I don't know. I think this guy obviously used himself as inspiration for Grand Wee. Like Suskin? Yeah. Do we talk about him being a recluse? No, not yet. Yeah, but, well, but I want you to take me through your your thought. So I think this book might possibly be about writing because the way he describes writing is... or Sorry, the way he describes smell or Grand Wee relating to smell is how I honestly feel about writing. It's reducing things down to their essence reducing people down to their essence, um, seeing things in kind of a secret way that no one else really sees them in, which is actually very beautiful and true. It's like the truest, in a way, the truest way to look at somebody is their smell. At least Grand Wee thinks this in the book. But because he sees in this beautiful, secret way, he's also extremely alienated from everybody else. And he's trying to use smell as a way to find his own identity and connect to people. So, you know, like ultimately, after he smells that girl with the plums, and that's the most beautiful scent he's ever smelled, and that's the most connected he's ever been to his own life, he, his goal becomes to condense that 
down to a concentrated perfume that he can put on himself and basically have people relate to him in the same way because of the smell. Basically, to wrap this up, I think that smell is a way to look at people and things in their essence, in their true state. And I think that if you're good, that's what you're supposed to be able to do with writing, too. And obviously, Suskind is a writer. He's a recluse like Grand Wee. And he obviously sees things on this same deeper secret level. But clearly, he's messed up socially. He can't relate to people. And I think this book was his version of Granwee's master perfume at the end that he makes. So that's that's my spiel on that. Can I say I just love it? The book? No, I love your theory. <laughs> oh. I would never be able to take it that far. Yeah, I think I articulated it better the other day, but hopefully you get the gist. What, what do you think, Rafi? Well, I didn't... I mean, now I, I like your interpretation. I am... Um... I took it a little more literally, just how smells can really influence someone or the fact that he just wanted to be loved and be like those girls where, you know, they were so sweet and kind and he wanted to take their smell and I guess embody that feeling that they were giving to people. That's all I... So you think he's used the the perfume in the book, as him in, he does, he's using the writing of his. I think so. I can't prove it. But, you know, when writing is good, you're writing about what you know. And, I mean, this had to come from somewhere, this huge story and this character and this completely different way of looking at things. And that's the only way I can make sense of it. I like it. I also, like it. if you look at, you know, any of the descriptions where he's talking about how something smells the language really takes off like you were talking about. And I was rereading a lot of those paragraphs just on their own, the descriptions of smells. And they're, you, if you just took them out of context, they could almost be like a standalone poem. Because the descriptions are not just... Like in a normal book, if, you're, if somebody was going to describe smell, it'd probably just be a stack of adjectives like stinky, spicy, you know, sweaty. But the language gets so unique there. It's, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example right now. I mean, anywhere you open that book, they describe smell. Yeah. And, and he, he does exactly that on all of them. Well, yeah, so. I, guess, I guess one way it's poetic is instead of using, he never uses adjectives like that. Well, maybe like a handful of times in the book. But in these descriptions, he'll say like the girl, like the girl's genitals, sorry to be gross. He doesn't just say like it's yeasty or salty or whatever he says <laughs> it's water lilies and fish which is that's a poetic device metaphor and it's a, it's a, he nails it down like every smell not just this one but in general he he nails it down you know what he's talking about that's i think that's what makes it so rich yeah and it connects so many different things that you would never think to connect with smell but it's good because you you kind of know what he's talking about, like it's true. And he didn't smell he didn't smell um, a specific part of your body. He first started smelling the combination of your smell, like the totality of the smell. And as he was getting closer, he opens up later on and he describes each individual part of your body how it smelled. Yeah, I think I think it was beautiful. But let's talk about the writer a little bit more. Well, the unique thing about the author is that he is a recluse and there's barely in, any information on him. It's really hard to find information, you know, about his life. And um, he never really does interviews and he doesn't get photographed. So that's something unique that I've never seen in an author. Usually famous authors, people that have had famous novels will be photographed and interviewed. So I thought that was pretty unique. What I, what I found about him, which, yeah, it's very difficult to find anything about him. He never gave really any interviews. But New York Times had an article. They said that Suskin submerged himself in the world of odors for more than two years while writing perfume. And during his researches, he said he bought a motor scooter and drove through the perfume-producing country of southern France, just sniffing. 
And he said basically because he had his helmet on and the goggles on the on the scooter on his Vespa, he was basically able to just smell and not how you say it. Um, like with his other senses being deprived, he it heightened his sense of smell. That is exactly what it I'm sharpened to say. it. Yeah, yeah. Which I think it's it's very interesting. Yeah, for like two years to research smell. I've heard that like blind people, when they go blind, develop really good hearing. Yeah. So maybe it's like a small version of that. And he also declined five thousand dollar prize uh, from a German newspaper because they gave him like the best, the first best novel in German. I can't decide if I think that's snobby or cool. It can be both. Well, I think. It's probably a, a genuine thing from him and not like a publicity stunt because this guy clearly doesn't like oh, to be around yeah. people or have any contact with people if he, if he doesn't have to. And you can see because you cannot find any information, nothing. Yeah, and you can, I mean, you can see it just in the book. Whoever wrote this is a really... And that proves your point more. Did you like Grand Wee as a main character? I did. I did a lot. I, I'm, I, I love the guy. Which that's why I said it's actually in the beginning I said it's scary because I it, you read something so horrible that he's doing and you fall in love with his character and yeah you almost can't blame him though no when you know his whole story no no I mean you can he should totally be killed and go <laughs> yeah, to jail yes for but what he did, but but if you start reading the book and stuff in the beginning you will see um, how bar of a life he had like from the from the start when he was born in the fish market like so so you can't really blame him and you do fall in love with him later on it's weird because yeah he's technically a villain and not like most villains you read about or see in movies he's not someone that's you know feeling super angry or you know going on like a killing spree of rage he's just someone that really doesn't like people can't communicate with people he's, and he has a lot of passion for what he's doing yeah when it comes to perfume <laughs> but other than that he's very emotionless i mean he's really freaky he's creepy he's just creepy all the time and so it's weird that you end up rooting for him when he's killing Not the girls and you don't want and you don't and you don't want him to get caught you know when he has the the girl in like that chamber the in the water or the oil and oh, when he's in the flower place? Yeah, once he gets it, that's like towards the end. You just don't want anybody to, to catch him, but really you should be saying, oh my God, can someone <laughs> stop this guy? I figured, well, maybe I'm a sexist, but I've, I was figuring since you were a girl, you were going to really not like Graham Wee because he's murdering girls. I think the only time I was really sad was the girl at the very end, the last girl. I really didn't want her to oh, die. With I her thought, father trying to protect her so much. Yeah, I mean, I figured she wasn't going to make it, but I was almost shocked that he did kill her. And I can't even imagine how horrible that must have looked when he, but how when he found her. How exciting was that? That whole, whole part, part was yeah. so stressful. You, you were like, how is he going to be able to pull it off? To find her, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. No, that was a very um, exhilarating part of the book. Well, if you haven't read the book, now you know everything that happened in the book. So <laughs> I wasn't no reason. too shocked when that happened because that w that girl's father was like the last main side character that was in the book. Mm -hmm. And I noticed a pattern after, I guess, halfway through the book. All the side characters that Gran Wee bumps into, they all die, end up getting horribly killed or destroyed or something terrible happens to them they but all it's not die just, in really random ways yeah and it's not just like they die it's like the only small goal they had in their life gets turned against them and the opposite thing happens like when he's at the orphanage with madame gaillard it tells you that her only goal is to save up enough money from the orphans to buy like a little house to live in alone when she retires and she never wants to go like her goal is not to die in a hospital yeah and as soon as grand Wee's done with her and he moves on instantly there's like a depression in the economy and all she loses all her money she has to sell everything and she gets shoved into a hospital and dies of tuberculosis in a bed with like 15 other people that this is what happens to everybody he meets though in the book and i just thought that was weird 
they don't just die but like they die ironically almost like he's like the like devil or cursed. something yeah yeah or mm-hmm. cursed or i wasn't sure what that meant but i thought it was interesting he's like a an evil spirit yeah well one thing we um totally skipped over was uh why has this book been banned and uh, why was it banned <laughs> well so let, let's be clear this book has murder it has lots of weirdo sexual stuff in it a lot of violence abuse of kids uh, orgies oh yeah uh blasphemous stuff against religion so it's hard to find exactly where this book is banned like it's it's not on ala or anything but it was banned at a school in scotland after many complaints that it was obscene and disgusting and it was withdrawn from the library of John Johnstone High School in I can't say this Renfrewshire, Shire, Shire. Oh, know. Renfrewshire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the famous. Um, and it and it caused a lot of protests in in Scotland in the school. So. Yeah, well, that that's what I was gonna say. It's you can't find much about this book being banned online, but we've already read books that got banned for much much less right than this so even if it's not all over the internet it's definitely a banned book and spirit what do you guys think of the ending when grand we gets his master sent finally together it was the craziest ending to anything i've ever read or seen to be clear what happens is he does achieve his goal of making the master scent which is built off the scent of basically these beautiful virginal girls that he murders and he he's gets, being tried yeah he gets for that, his murder he, he gets caught for all these murders and uh, he gets tortured a little and they sentence him to die in front of a crowd of people but he has his like the whole city yeah he has his perfume with him though and, and they, they come sorry they come from all around town i mean it's a whole event it's a beautiful event they come for entertainment to see him die yeah, well, he's famous by this point for yeah. killing everybody, so everybody wants to see him die. But they don't know that he has this little vial of the perfume he made with him, and he dabs it on himself, and does somebody else want to describe what happens after that? <laughs> well, yeah, he, he dabs it one drop of it. That's how he describes it, just a drop of it, before he went out on the stage. And from that moment on, everyone falls in love with him, Immediately, everything he's done, it doesn't matter anymore. And the whole town goes into an orgy. Yes. They say he's an angel. Yeah. Even the father of the last girl that gets killed. Who who before the the trial, he wanted him dead and he was very upset with him. It was torturing him. Yeah. So even him, he says he forgives him and he wants him to be his son. Yeah. That... I thought when I was reading this part, I had to go back and reread. It was confusing. The, yeah, I, I had to go back thing. and reread the paragraph because I was like, "Is this a dream or is this actually happening?" And then it I went, realized it was actually happening. It went from on to off, like yes, it was, just, it was yeah. just a total switch. It really was shocking. And it showed you, it showed you right there the power of one drop, and yeah. there is a reason he he said one drop because. Later on, more happens. I don't know. Do we I know that's why I was like, do we spoil the very, very end? I feel like we should leave I mean, that up already... to. I mean, we spoiled the whole thing. We so... did. Well, first of all, was the big punch at the end for you guys just the orgy starting and him getting away with murder, basically? Or was it what happened right after that where he still can't be happy? That's that one. That that part really yeah. shocked me. That I wasn't expecting that at all. I thought he's just going to go and live in a mountain or something. But he kept traveling. And you heard how the writer described him, how sad he was with everything. Not with everything he's done, but how disappointed with everything he is. And the big punch, like you said, was the very end. I think it was the most... But it's still not enough. Which one? He's accomplished his goal. Everybody technically loves him but i think he realizes but he's still not that. happy yes but no it's actually the ending oh the very oh. ending. the very ending i think it was it was absolutely extraordinary 
what the writer did. Well, I think when that happened, I mean, the ending you're talking about, the ending ending is really cool. But when this happened to me, that was like the end of his character. Like he's dead pretty much after that. He has nothing left because one thing we forgot to mention is I think you could say the main thing that motivates Grand Wee in this book is after he realizes he doesn't have a scent himself and that the way he sees people and sees their identity and their their essence really as people is through smell Mm -hmm. but ironically he doesn't have one of himself his goal mainly is to get his own smell and he wants that smell to be this perfume and why the what happened after the orgy hit me so hard is because he gets that basically he gets a smell yeah the best of smells if you will (laughs) and even then it's not him it's not enough. Yeah. So he, I don't think he thought him. it was his own identity. No. Yeah, because people really just loved him for the smell. No one actually liked him or loved him. Yeah. So that it was sad. That part destroyed him. And then you you can say the ending ending because this was really cool. The ending for me, uh, it was the cherry on top of this book. I was already into it. It was already in my top one. <laughs> <laughs> of all my books but the ending was amazing so basically what happens is he travels through an area with um, a lot of I guess homeless people and and bad people kind of thing and CD part of town yeah and <laughs> he takes the whole bottle the little bottle that he had and he dabs it all over his head and suddenly everybody turns around looks at him approaches him and starts eating him alive. Whoa. I don't that know. was shocking to me. It was powerful. That's why I said earlier, one drop did what it had to do to the whole town. Yeah, and I, I remember... Um, no, I think no, no character could die better than this. No, it was a, a great death and a great end for him. But uh, especially because the author goes out of his way to let you know Nobody remembers the orgy after it happens, and nobody remembers anything about Grand Wee at all. Even though he was this famous murderer, they basically all forget him. And it kind of ties up nicely going back to the way the book started, because in the first paragraph, it says, this is Grand Wee, he's good at smelling, and the interesting thing about smelling is it doesn't leave any trace in history. Do you remember that line? No. The opening paragraph of the books it, it's talking about grand Wee and smelling and how he's gifted with smelling and it ends the paragraph by saying smell is unique because it doesn't leave any trace in history it's just i like that yeah it's just there you can't really record it or anything yeah you know and that's how he ends exactly just he comes and goes yeah like a fart <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just one more little detail I wanted to talk about. Um, but between the orgy and him getting eaten alive, this sounds so wild if it's out of context. <laughs> I know, right? Anyways, between those two things, it talks about how much he could do with just that little vial of perfume. Like he could, it said he could put it on a letter and send it to the Pope, and the Pope would declare him as, like as the second coming of Jesus. Or he could like take over a country with it or do all this stuff. But he doesn't want to do any of that. That's how upset he is that he still hasn't made any kind of connection to people. So I think that was ultimately the only way Grand Wee was kind of redeemable. I mean, he's totally evil, but he was sad basically because he wanted to connect to people. And there was something deep down that, you know, wanted to be loved and whatever and it didn't get satisfied so he got eaten he was a beautiful monster (laughs) (laughs) like uh, Edward from Twilight exactly beautiful and damned well thanks for listening you can follow us on Facebook Instagram Twitter and um, make sure you subscribe to this podcast and give us a 5 star rating on Apple and remember If a book is banned, it's worth reading.